All right, welcome to day two of the Diana Initiative. Here in track two, we have Yana Paris with us from Australia. She's an offensive security engineer. In her own words, uh, sadly, she doesn't get to ride a kangaroo to work because she's working remote most of the time. All right, Yana, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making it. Good morning. I'm so excited to be part of the Diana Initiative. And I'm really excited to share some stories about how developing secure relationships has led me to some more secure development. So I'm Jana, I'm a security engineer at a, an organization in Australia. We're kind of like Indeed. We've got over 3,000 employees, so not too small, but not too big. We also are all over the Asia Pacific region. So I work with a lot of teams in Southeast Asia and Brazil as well as in Australia and New Zealand. I work on a lot of open source software and I'm co-authoring a few libraries at the moment. I'm also a volunteer. I love to teach kids. I love to teach people of all ages and I think education should be free, so that's pretty important to me. And I do some outreach work as well. I felt like it was important to talk a little bit about my journey because everyone's journey is a bit different. I've always been a tinkerer and I've always been driven to know how and why of everything. But my path wasn't straightforward, and I think it's important to highlight that we all have our own paths filled with challenges we face and overcome. I left home at 15, so I had to work a lot. I didn't finish my last two years of high school. I didn't even know if I wanted to go to uni, but I knew what I enjoyed, and that was video games and making websites. <laughs> And then I did a bit of volunteering and decided, hey, I also really love art, so why not try a degree in digital media design? And I was pretty shocked that I was accepted, but hey, that was awesome. I also got a business grant to start a business in web development and hosting, and that was super challenging. I've never really been one to just sit and focus on school. I always like to apply it to real life, so that was pretty important to me. And at this point in time, I thought I was going to be working as a game developer. And then as I was running the business for a few years, I decided I wanted to get deeper into systems, into computer science. And when I did get into a computer science degree, I actually found myself with a Microsoft HoloLens, which does augmented reality. It's kind of like a digital overlay over your reality when you're looking out. And I loved it. And again, I'm like, yes, I'm going to do game development in virtual reality or augmented. Uh, but that didn't happen. And then after working for a few years, I finally had the privilege and resources and time to get diagnosed with autism and ADHD. And it changed my life uh, in many different ways. And it kind of solidified a lot of the things that I already enjoyed doing. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to dive into it. And when I had the opportunity to become a security engineer and break things, I dove straight into that. Um, on here, I've just got a few funny like screenshots. I love playing video games like Farming Simulator. <laughs> and that's me hovering on a crate, because if you jump on the crate, on a crate of eggs, you can actually just hover right up to the ceiling and then fall down. And that's pretty fun. Um, that I've also been playing around with code review and trying to find bugs and, you know, I love buffer overflows and getting deep into the OS. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a bit of fun. But the one thing that I kept thinking about was who made what I'm breaking? How do they feel about it? I was having a lot of conversations with, my pe with people in my team and it reminded me of that empathy factor. And the who was what led me to more secure relationships. So throughout the talk, when I'm talking about apps, I'm actually talking about any software application from web, software, game development. If people are using the software that you're making, if you work with others in a small team, small business or a big organization to make software, those are the apps that I'm talking about. And the relationships, are the ones where you represent security within your working relationships. And how the more secure a relationship is, the more secure our apps can become. Organizations reflect how complex our software systems are. They're super interconnected. And relationships are part of that complex system. There are so many dynamics at play. And it's not just the culture and how people work with each other or the tech we use. It's how they interact with each other. 
the teams and the departments, and how we respond to those interactions. When both these things are secure, it leads to a more secure organization. And while I work for a bigger organization, this talk can, well, and this advice and learnings can be applied to any situation where you represent security. But what is an insecure relationship? An insecure relationship can feel like low engagement. People aren't reaching out to you. They're not asking questions about the things you're doing, what you're learning. It can feel like or is compliance. Security just becomes a checkbox. Conversations seem resistant. There's inconsistent communication. Document documentation contradicts the latest advice someone gave in a workshop. It's not making sense and it doesn't fit into people's workflows. There's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. So how can we grow this to secure relationships? It's built on a solid foundation. And that solid foundation is two-way. It's not just two-way communication. It's two-way learning where you're teaching other people and you're learning from them as well. It's supportive. You are active about helping them. You create a space for people to be honest about their thinking, to be wrong, where it's okay to not have all the answers. It's built on trust. They trust that they can come to you and they will get some clear action on what to do next. But why this talk? As an industry, we throw around a lot of jargon like zero trust, threat modeling, stride, dread, or you know, any in-house thing that you've developed. There's a lot of technical terms and concepts and not always a lot of context for people, the why and how to action it. What does it actually mean to them? We add Swiss cheese models talking about multiple layers of defense, but how do they all work together? What does that actually look like? And the shift left, <laughs> often accompanied with a lot of dollar signs. The more conversations I have with people in and outside of my team, the more the same things have been coming up. They want to work with people across the organization. They want to collaborate with teams that aren't just security. We want to build and maintain solutions that have diverse thinking. And it kept coming back to building secure software needs different kinds of people. We as a security industry decided it's important. So what can it look like? We have different stakeholders, different people with different priorities, but they're all people we build relationships with. And as an individual person working in security, we often represent the whole of security when we're talking to them. We encourage collaboration and we try to teach others all the great security stuff that we know, but it's not just one way. You can represent all of security when someone interacts with you, and that's important to understand. It's complex and interconnected. Actions lead to things that are invisible to us. Perhaps you did a workshop for engineering, and engineering went and taught those learnings to UX and design, and someone had a conversation with legal, and it led to some action that we didn't quite see. And it's even harder now with working from home. At least when I was in the office, I could overhear conversations about a weird phishing email or someone not locking their computer. It became more critical to uncover where we're not getting feedback, to uncover that invisibility. And while at the same time, making it easier for people and systems to give us that feedback. Where have secure relationships helped me? Well, they definitely help in incident response because I need to know who I'm reaching out to, and I need to know that they trust me when I ask them to do, do something, especially in such a panicked moment. When I started focusing on the who, I saw more and more how it was helping so many other aspects of my work as well. We have a huge platform and environment where I work, and there's a lot of different people, and security are trying to work alongside them. Now, I won't go into Log4j itself, but when I was in Log4j response mode, it was, it was difficult. In, but instead of, um, I guess I was suddenly faced with a moment where people across the business needed to be involved. And it was a Saturday night and I had to make the call of whether to reach out to a team or not. I was already working this incident, so I knew that I'd be working long hours, but they didn't. I needed to know who I needed to involve and the, the key path to remediation. I needed to give direction with clarity. And I needed to believe that they trusted me when I told them what needed to be done. 
And that's not just true for incident response, it's true for any activity that we do in security. We need to know who we need to reach out to in the organization. We need to understand their pain points, any friction, and we have to be really clear about what we want and what they need to do and when. But what's the problem with a lot of the things I just mentioned? A lot of them are really reactive things. And we're always telling people to be more proactive, but what does that really mean? If they're unsure of what they need to do, how can they be proactive about it? We need to be clear about what we need, when we need it, and how. We need to be able to give them a space that they can ask us questions. So where do we go from here? It's about taking the initiative. And we do that with knowledge, knowing that what it is we're trying to achieve and setting out goals, understanding the process. It's the same when we ask people to be proactive about security. We are asking people to take the initiative, but to take the initiative, they need to know how. And this is where secure relationships are important. Maybe you're new to the company and you wanna navigate the business or organization. It's a different structure. There's new technology, new people, new priorities for your team. Find out what's important, what areas of the business have been really proactive, what does that really look like, and where hasn't that been happening? Perhaps you want to pilot new ideas or validate existing ones. I like to talk to a mix of teams, some that love to trial anything new that we have and pilot new ideas ones that need to work fast, and teams that are experimenting with their area of the business. They're not always ready to trial new ideas, but they are ready to adopt them. But really, whatever your goals, what they all have in common is feedback. How do people and systems engage with security? How do we get started? How do we create relationships that translate to a more secure business? It's pretty overwhelming, so I've come up with a few strategies on how I usually get started. Ask yourself, where do you want to be involved? You could have some specific goals or some vague ones. You might wanna validate a process or tool that you already have. Maybe you're trying to decommission something or introduce a new practice. Maybe you didn't come from an engineering background. Maybe you want to use your diverse perspective about how you can build up on secure relationships outside of engineering and security. What knowledge can you bring to other people and their teams? I mean, I have conversations about risk most of the time. Sometimes these are facilitated by technical activities like pen testing, and other times it's mapping out and using other people's language. So I had a security process that I was tasked with rolling out to engineering at my work. And I needed to understand what it did. Who was it for? How should it work? And what's the outcome? I didn't know the state of it. Is the tool even working? Is it relevant? Nobody has looked at it in a while. I don't even know who's taking care of it. I was given the solution without knowing what the problem was we were trying to solve. It was that vague, be more secure, be proactive messaging again. In fact, the problem was really vague for a lot of people, including the security team. We wanted improved security practices, but what kind of security practices? How will they improve and when will that be done? So I investigated. I went and spoke to some teams. I had a look at some of the alerting and I saw who was using the tool and who wasn't. I was able to reach out to some of these teams and ask them what their experience was with it. I also wanted to know what the security team's expectations was of using this process and tool. Can we support them? So I thought, why not spend a bit more time digging in and talking to people? I wanted to really validate that this was working. So I had to engage with the people using it, the target audience. I spoke to a colleague about what I wanted to do and when I told them, they were like, no, nah, that's a waste of time. I can't see any value in that. If I want something done, I should just make a policy and everyone will follow it, right? Well, I did a bit of digging and we did have a policy for this process and still nobody was following it. So I went back to the investigating and validation process. And I'm really visual and 
I love, love to map things out. I'm always with post-its, I'm always with diagrams. So this is what I found out. It's pretty simplified, but I wanted to map out the first time a person hears or reads about this processing tool when they use the tool, and it ended up looking a little bit like this diagram. I wanted to highlight which teams were involved and when, the people and the decisions that needed to be made, and what types of feedback we need. I spoke to people who used the tool and process recently. I spoke to those who had never used it. I noted a lot of the friction or questions people had at each phase. In the awareness phase, when do they first hear about it? Are they at internal engineering talks? Are they written policies? How are they finding those written policies? Who is telling them about it? Is it from the heads of engineering, executives, security, their leads, other people in their team? And have people actually learned that process? Now, coming from a software engineering background, I wanted to make sure that if I'm rolling this out to other people, that it works for, their, for them, for their workflow, because I didn't want to roll something out that, that I didn't feel confident with. Do they know exactly how to use this and how often? Is it something that's going to cause friction? Like, these are so many questions that we just didn't have the answers to. And even with implementation, okay, so they're using, using it now, that's great, but is it still working and who's maintaining it? Can it be improved in any way? Can others contribute or is it locked down to just security and why would that be? And the outcome, this is a tricky one because even security weren't sure of what the outcome should be. Does the team have to follow up with work? What kind of work? How much of it? When do they need to do it by? What does security ultimately want from this? Is it more visibility? If so, how do we even get that? We want more secure apps? How? There were a few unanswered questions and some parts of the process that still felt a bit opaque. And I realized validating required some kind of feedback loop, and in fact, many feedback loops at many of these phases. And instead of me telling people when to use it, can they tell me how they adapted their workflow to make sure they're following this process? This is where pilot teams became really helpful. I was able to fail quickly so that we could continue to adapt and change or just move on, find something else that might work. I got a lot of feedback from people, but I also got a lot of feedback from the system. So it's not just one-on-one -on -one conversations or people texting me about it. It's alerting. It's, it's so many other things. All of this enables the people using that process. And by going through this, you will identify a lot of work, uh, but this burden is not all on your shoulders. Some of these your security team can help with and others may need contribution from other teams. So how can you get started? Well, what feedback are you missing at the moment? Talk about, talk to your team, observe and search, look for some work that's currently out there. What seem to be the problems that keep coming up? Are there questions that keep coming up in your text channels maybe that you can address? From here, it opens up branches of teams or people to get to know as you develop these secure relationships across the business. It's important to understand who you're building a relationship with. This is where we bring empathy. It's about mutual understanding, building up rapport. Who are we building up a relationship with? What's their culture? How do they work? It's not just about how they work within their teams, but also within the country they might live in. I know that working with a lot of my Southeast Asian teams, that it can be very hierarchical. And I know that I need to reach out to team leads or engineering managers, and then I'm invited into, you know, perhaps their meetings. Are they interested? Do they even have time to try out new tools or processes and ways of working? Do they want to help improve workshops for secure coding or other topics that we want to roll out? So meet our app team. App teams can be super varied. Sometimes they're just full of software engineers. Other times it could include business analysts, data scientists, UX designers, product managers, people from all over the organization. The better we understand the structure, the clearer our advice and guidance can be. 
Our app team uses security processes and tools, at least the ones that they know about. They make awesome software and they feel pretty confident about it. And they really do want to include security. But they're feeling like when they use those security processes and tools, they don't quite work for them. They're not always sure how to make their software more secure. And they want to include security, but they don't always know when to reach out. There's a lot of tension and a lack of understanding each other. For example, I have been uplifting some of our security requests and those kind of processes. And I've added an answer in there that is plainly, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. And that's actually a really good talking point for me. So when I do reach out to that team, I can find out what is it that you don't know? Is how can we help with that? And why is that happening? After working with that team for a while, the product manager became a bit more comfortable reaching out to me and saying, hey, it's not that I just don't know. Some of these concepts and terms are a bit too technical for me. And I thought, oh, yeah, you're right. I should have thought of that. So I added some links to clarification, some documentation. I added some examples so they could understand what exactly they were filling out. I needed to understand when to engage. And when you want to engage with new people or teams, it's really important to set out those expectations up front. How often will you be meeting them? Is it for a focused project? Or do you want to meet them every two weeks to build up that initial relationship? I've tried a variety of things, and one of the most valuable meetings I go to is usually a team's retrospective. It's where they talk about what went right, what went wrong, and how they can improve. I get the most engagement here. And when I'm there, they usually ask me a ton of questions. They show me how and why something went wrong. I learn what their priorities are. And if they have these questions and concerns, others must have them too. I can guide them through assessing the risk of security issues that are still unresolved. And when we both have understanding of each other, then they can better accept or mitigate that risk as well. Understanding who is all about asking questions to find out where current pain points or any friction is in using tools, processes, or communicating with your team. We need to set these expectations and objectives really clearly. And different needs will require, require those different relationships, whether it's a point in time with a particular issue or if it's an ongoing focus project. And don't just appear when things go wrong, because it feels kind of awkward when you jump into a meeting and they're like, ooh, what did we do? <laughs> but that will happen, and, and it's okay. I think as the relationship matures, it will be when something goes wrong. But they, you would have built that support and trust with them by that point. How you use and teach language matters. It's really important here to learn how to use language and phrases that are inclusive, inclusive of people, genders, race, religion, tech experience, lived experience. Being technical can be for everyone. We can build on existing knowledge. We can create common understanding through these conversations. And we can provide these technical details to those who want them. We bring our expertise, but they also bring theirs. We're sharing and teaching technical concepts with empathy. We need to ask and listen to how others learn. And sometimes we need to explicitly ask how others learn. I know that for me, learning how I learn after I was diagnosed with autism, and even before then, I needed to know that if I was going to learn something, it wasn't just going to be slabs of text. Although sometimes that does work, I also really love diagrams. And so I'm often drawing those for myself as well. We need to be respect respectful of the way people like to work. So we need to work out, do they need information before the session? I usually prefer to give information to everyone before then. They can read it in their own time. And if they wanna come with questions, that's great. Some people feel a little bit more prepared with that. Some of the best fun that I have with teams is 101 talks, and that's often pretty ad hoc, but other times I try to plan those out as well. So I get questions about what exactly is a pen test? What do you do? And you know, how do you find things? How do you find bugs and then exploit them? 
Other times I've been asked about social engineering and phishing and what does that actually mean and is it important? Is it something that I should care about? This is a pretty nonsense sentence, but I'm trying to highlight that domain-specific language is difficult and it comes up everywhere. It's not unique to cybersecurity. We can mean so many different things with some of our acronyms. IR could mean incident response or infrared. SME was one that tripped me up quite a lot when I first joined the business. Sometimes it's sub subject matter expert, other times it's small and medium enterprises. And I even heard this yesterday and I was like, oh, brought back memories. And then we add shift left, zero trust and cheers and people are getting really overwhelmed. It can feel like simlish, it can feel like a made up language. You might have absorbed some of this, like maybe 30% of it, and even then you need to be sure that you've got the domain right. Every domain is like this. And I'm not saying don't use acronyms or don't use domain-specific language and technical concepts, but be mindful when you do. Say a quick explanation. Make it explicit at the beginning that if there are any terms you use that people are unsure of, reach out to you. Give them the resources for next time. I know when I first joined the business, I started this habit. In fact, it was me and a few people in my team where we'd put our hand up every time there was an acronym we didn't understand. Present information in different ways. So as I've mentioned a few times, I do love diagrams, but I also like listening to things. I like watching things. I'm very process driven. I'm also very hands on. So ask other people, how do they learn best? Do they want to workshop? Do they want to work through something on their own? Do they need it to be guided? They need a mechanism to understand technical security concepts and to learn these over time. Use documentation and language that they already use. Encourage building documentation or diagrams together. It's a great way to understand the business stack. Technical language can be for everyone. We just need to bring empathy. This is a talk that um, I've linked to, I'll provide the slides later, but it's storytelling with data. And it's one that has inspired me in a lot of my talks and how I present a lot of data to people. It shows you how to break down graphs and things like that so that people can understand and absorb that information. So this is a really handy one for you to look up. Make it relatable. So something I do quite a lot is threat modeling. And I like to make that a bit relatable. I don't like to just throw people in there and they don't know what to expect, especially with people who have never done that before. A threat model is a conversation about what can go wrong. I work with software developer graduates delivering security workshops, and I use what they're familiar with. They're new to the business and often they've never worked in a technical environment or it's their first job. So I teach these technical concepts through storytelling, but I like to give a context. I like to make it a little bit funny and I provide the details afterwards. I let them know and I show them why it's important and what makes the, these things a risk. I mean, we have APTs with so many different numbers. So I decide to create my own based on real ones, ones that we might face. Uh, I call them threat groups and I give them silly names and sometimes it's Pink Butterfly who's financially motivated. I let them know exactly what to expect, that they might, we might be running a tabletop session with our accounts people, for instance. They're familiar with seeing certain document types. They get these emails all the time. And I've heard from a lot of small businesses, especially in Australia, that where people are just unfortunately being fished from emails that are asking for payments. And it's not just a few thousand dollars, like it could be hundreds of thousand dollars for these businesses. So I want to create examples that are ones that can be imagined. I want to explain it in terms that everyone can understand. And it can and should be based on the real world. Use this as the opportunity to teach language and co concepts in a way that they'll remember. Effective learning requires effective communication. So bring your empathy, ask people explicitly about how they learn best and collaborate with them. 
mindset over matter. When I speak to new teams, sometimes they can seem a bit defensive or resistant. It feels as if they're not really shifting into that security mindset. And I, I just kind of get stuck, like, what do I do here? And then I realize when we're working on a problem, we can get tunnel vision. So I'm building the security barrier. It's super awesome. It's got the best orange paint and Icelandic engineering that I could find. And then security come along and tell me that there's all these ways to bypass it and what is surrounding that. And it's blowing my mind. It's like I was working on the security barrier and I forgot to think creatively or how do I even shift into that mindset of thinking creatively? I haven't learned those concepts before. So I need to be able to share and story tell what these actually mean. And, you know, sometimes we're brute forcing our way through as well. So when I'm writing tests for software, this is where it becomes really apparent. So think about a password. We've all either set one or had to reset it. There's some kind of value. There's characters that we use in there. There's a length. It passes or it fails. We have some expectations of that input and what it should return. But we as security, we work in the realm of the what if. Where are the bounds of what could go wrong? And how could I misuse the software? We have to think about different motivations, creative paths to get to that critical information. That's the kind of mindset that we're trying to share. We're talking about so many different terms like an overrun or validation. Can they get to use information? Can they authenticate as another user? What we think are hard bounds is actually where we get creative. We work in the realm of the what if and we're productively paranoid about it. We have to think about different motivations, creative paths to get to that critical information and tests don't always capture or anticipate if I've walked into a business and just asked someone for the password and they've given it to me, which I did as part of an engagement for work. They even helpfully showed me how to uh, access the underlying OS and get admin privileges. So that was pretty cool too. Or how about thinking about, we need a password to enter an AV system and to get into the system settings. What if rebooting it and turning it back on and you could get into those system settings quickly enough, didn't need a password, which did happen again. These are the kinds of things that we don't capture with this pass-fail kind of thinking, and often this is the mindset we need to shift people into. Use-misuse stories. So who is using it and who is misusing it? I spoke about threat groups, but sometimes it's just a user that's clicking things around. I know I do that all the time. I just want to see what happens. What are, the, what are their motivations and what type of information do they want? When I'm running pen tests, I like to brainstorm about this, and not just with my security team, but with the team that built the thing. They, they know it really well, and then we can get creative about it together before we jump down the rabbit hole. Do we want to improve a response to a particular scenario, like ransomware? Are we rebuilding a feature? These are all things where these use and misuse stories are super helpful. And if it's something that you like to be creative with, it's something that you can really help teams with. So we've spoken about insecure relationships, how they can feel like low engagement, how it might feel like compliance, or it is compliance, how conversations seem resistant, and they can seem confu confused and misunderstood. But where in the beginning of developing this relationship, you might be following up with the team and a person quite a lot. But then you'll find that they start reaching out to you. That participation becomes a lot more active. Your collaboration is less about specific security things that they need to have explained and more about creative problem solving. I see this more and more with internal pen testing as well. Some teams that are now used to the process with us, it goes so differently to the first time that we did it. Our conversations are so different it's much more open and it's usually led by them. It becomes more specific to a security problem solving rather than surface level questions. 
And we set these, ex these security objectives together very explicitly. This is where I like to mitigate some of that confusion and understanding. I want them to know what we are doing, why we're doing it. We all need to understand. If our app teams are super varied and they're not always full of software engineers talking the same language, then we need to be mindful of that. When is this work due by and who is accountable or what service is accountable for it? What system? There's another talk that is probably a good one for you to watch if you want to think about how we communicate data to people and what stories that tells. So rather than telling someone you've got 130 like critical vulnerabilities that you need to get to, what is the important information that they, they need to action? So I definitely recommend watching this one. I'd love for you to think about how you can make technical concepts and security more relevant. How can you bridge people's thinking to get into that security mindset? Can you provide the context and vocabulary? Can you use a bit of humor? Can you include diverse perspectives, not just in roles and work experiences, but in cultures and lived experiences? This is how we get more robust products that appeal to a diverse audience, but it's also how we get more, more robust security solutions. And we're there to guide, not to redesign, although sometimes we are involved in the redesigning process as well. We just need to trust that they're experts in their domain and we're there to be experts in ours. We've guided them through some risky conversations. Maybe we're meeting regularly and we're teaching them language, phrases and terminology. Everyone is becoming more comfortable. So we're facilitating these conversations. They could be one-on-one. -on -one. They could be on Zoom or in person. They could be via text. It could be incidental. It could be through presentations. Maybe you've created a workshop. But now that we know how the teams learn best, we can start presenting information in the way that they will understand too. If you're speaking to UX, talk to them about the range of information we might disclose or leak that shouldn't be exposed. Talk about why that is and discover solutions together that incorporate security and still achieve their goals. I spoke a bit about feedback loops and feedback loops can also be varied. They could be formally set up where you talk to someone or maybe it's a formally set up alert. It could be a point in time result or they could be just missing completely. If you're thinking, how can I get more involved? I definitely recommend, as I said before, use and misuse stories. I think they're the most fun and they can get really creative. You can create content for events or workshops. You don't need to deliver them if you don't feel comfortable doing so. And some people want them to be self-guided. You can record yourself delivering them if you want to. Introduce yourself at onboarding. Find out who you're introducing yourself to and then give them the relevant information that they're going to need. In fact, I really love, like I said before, working with grads because they're new and they challenge how people think. And if I can give them the information, they're gonna take it back to their team. The grads that I usually threat model with are the ones that are coming back to me when they're going into their new teams, they're coming, reaching out to me and saying, hey, that thing we did in that boot camp, can we do it again, but for my team on an actual product? And it's like, absolutely. So what can you do to create secure relationships? Hopefully this talk has you thinking about relationships and problem solving a little differently. I want you to be able to share your world and get people excited about it, learning and asking questions. You don't need to collaborate just within your team, collaborate outside of it. That's where I have the most fun. Set some clear objectives and expectations, share your world, Give it a go and be kind about it. I have a few acknowledgements to people who helped me with this presentation and a lot of conversations that I've had over time. But also if you're interested in the offensive side or web app hacking, then reach out to me because I've got a few vouchers that I'd love to give out to people who are learning. Hopefully I've sparked some ideas or reinforced some things you already know. I'm always learning and growing in this area too. 
So if you have any stories of what you do to create secure relationships, message me. I really want to talk about it. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. So, Yana, we do have one question from Discord. Are there ways to build relationships for people that are hesitant or have a hard time building them? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I guess for me as well, it, it might not seem it, but it can be pretty difficult for me to reach out to people and, and build up those relationships. Uh, sometimes I like to do it passively, and that's how I do it when I first joined the company. In, in my first three months, I was actually looking for where the engineers were. <laughs> were they going to meetups? Were they through guilds, um, which are like internal clubs? What were they doing? And they were on Zoom, so it was super like easy for me to join in. And because I was around, people started getting to know who I was. They would see my name pop up. And now, after years of working there, whenever I, my name pops up, they're always like, oh, security's here, don't, you know, don't do anything bad, or, you know, just being silly about it. But, yeah, there, there's a few, I'd love to talk to you more about it after the talk as well, but, yeah, there definitely is. <laughs> okay, not really a question. Um, I've been threat modeling for uh, decades. Um, this is proof that you can learn something every single day, no matter who it's from. Um, I just learned a ton from, I came in late, but just from half your presentation, you just gave me a whole bunch of new ideas on how to build the relationships with the devs and more. And I just wanted to thank you. Oh, thank you and so much. I lost my voice last night. <laughs> <laughs> that means a lot, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So how did you identify pilot teams, like people who are willing to do that? And did you have trouble getting management um, to accept using pilot rollouts? It's like, I know I've had issues where management's like, the whole organization needs to do this right now. So sometimes that can be a difficult conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So identifying pilot teams, um, that's an interesting question. I think I had, our organization is split up pretty strangely. We have a lot of sub-businesses as well. So what I did was I tried to look for parts of the business that were doing their own thing, like separated to the rest of us. It's, it's a bit hard to explain because it's kind of like all these little investments. But I mean, I reached out to them and I just spoke to them and I asked them if they were willing to do it. A lot of them were smaller teams as well and they were kind of self-governed. They didn't really have a lot of that overhead that I was finding the rest of engineering to have, um, that they had just had to go through so many, so many hoops. And to get people on board with the pilot idea, again, I think because they didn't have that overhead, we didn't need to go through that. I'm pretty lucky in that a lot of our leadership supports a lot of this like piloting of new ideas try something and fail fast um, I'll have to think about like the friction of that though so we can talk a little bit more about that later yeah thanks for your question awesome. thank you <laughs>